So um, just happened something strange here. So um, from there on, um, from an academic perspective, um, in the late, late 70s, um, these academics have founded Alvere, um, found quite uh, fast um, support all over Europe, and started with an association for electromobility with a vision on this electrification support. Um, today, our members are um, representing um, in different member states in, in Europe, also outside of the European Co Union. Um, we have two significant differences. We have associations that are representing the industry, but also the EV users. So it's a quite unique position. So we have indeed direct and indirect industry members, but also the EV user parts. I still see people are joining for the moment. So this brings us to, to the next point for today. Um, yeah, electromobility really kicked off about let's say, already a long time ago, but really uh, change happened about 10 years ago. And then it was really the question from, yeah, will it, will it indeed be happening? But the updates or the offtake from an improvement of the battery technology really made e-mobility happening. So then the, the question is from, yeah, is it possible? Is the performance good enough? Um, is it only possible for, uh, passenger vehicles, uh, which infrastructure do we need? Yeah, this is, these questions have meanwhile all been answered. So it's more about what's the next steps, which policy uh, mechanisms do we need for the future? We also see the price parity is coming and we see that not only uh, passenger cars can be electrified, but also um, buses, um, vans, um, and also different um, technologies that need battery, can be equipped with battery infrastructure. So um, we have, of course, from as an European uh, association, a focus on European markets and also European standards. So um, we see an upcoming policy change. Um, we already had a high commitment towards a sustainable a future and in the green line here we had the projections with existing measures um, till 2030 to 2050 but if we want to achieve the COP21 standards we will not we will not met this uh, by 2050 so the awareness of this um, was growing with the policy it came a bit along with with the COVID situation but um, on European level there is a higher support now to go for higher um, goals on reduction, remission. So um, now the first talks about decrease from 55 to 60 percent, and um, yeah, by really by 2050, by 100 percent. This will make a significant change in the near future, um, not only for, for passenger or car transport, but also for other industries. Um, we of course looking forward to this outcome, but this also brings that the industry really has to make an uptake and do a different approach to achieve this new emission standards. Um, what did Ruth bring us together here today is actually a, a talk that um, I had already a long time with our colleague from South Africa, Hitten uh, Palmer. Um, we see indeed a, a 
a challenge that we can um, strengthen to, to work in, in, in green mobility. And we have all on both sides learned lessons that they can always contribute to its deployment in all countries and in continents. So the next step is indeed to overcoming together the weakness of a fragment global response to, to mass zero emission transport. And it's of course necessary on, on common soil against the, the, the climate challenge. Um, indeed, climate change doesn't have borders. Um, we can aim for high emission targets, um, but it should also be achieved worldwide. Um, we have to look to technologies, yeah, opportunity to make valuable technologies, um, also the battery challenge. We need to make it um, equally and accessible for everyone. Then the last point, um, it's a concern that is also on policy level, and, and of course, uh, in Europe. Um, yeah, preventing a dumping graft. It should not be that industries deliver highly polluting products um, anywhere anymore. Uh, we should be really aware that this is a, it should be inclusive for everyone and accessible for everyone. Um, and it should not be possible that um, because we have higher targets, that um, there should be a that these targets are only focused on, on one continent and that we are dumping the rest uh, all over other places. Uh, that should be not be possible. And that brings me automatically to, um, to my next colleague, uh, or not next, to my colleague, uh, Hitten. Um, please, if you could introduce yourself and your organization, uh, we can start from there. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Philip, and, uh, and good morning to everybody, and, and thanks for making the time to, to join in the discussions today and, and just kick off on a conversation uh, on sustainable mobility in Africa. And, and as Philip has introduced, um, from uh, a various uh, position in existence for a number of years in the market in, in Europe and promoting and advancing electric mobility, um, and extending on, on multiple discussions and, and deliberations we've had in a number of forums through ULO's uh, participation internationally um, have been that uh, to let's extend the conversation into advancing electric mobility uh, access in Africa. And, and through that, uh, we'll have a number of insights being shared from, from key role players uh, and activities on the continent in Africa uh, following introduction presentations. Uh, and insights on, on their personal experiences and activities that are happening uh, towards advancing electric mobility uh, in Africa. Uh, some activities already on the ground and, and some insights will also be shared on that. Uh, so without further ado, I will uh, begin sharing my presentation and, and take you through that. Okay, so, so um, from my side, Hiten Palmer, Director of the National uh, Electric Mobility Program, ULO in South Africa. Uh, the program has been in existence uh, for the last seven years, uh, established in 2013 as an initiative of the Technology Innovation Agency, uh, to serve as a national multi-stakeholder program uh, focused on enabling, facilitating, and mobilizing uh, growth in electric mobility within transport, and also supporting the complementary green economy in South Africa and also extending into Africa through uh, learnings of best practices uh, locally in South Africa as well as leveraging uh, international insights. The program activities include uh, government lobbying around standards, policies and regulations to support electric mobility, engaging with industry, uh, all the, all, all the, all the uh, roles and responsibilities across the value chain from the OEMs, component manufacturers, and across the ecosystem for electric mobility. Uh, we active, have activities on enterprise development support uh, through supporting facilities and, and uh, funding of, of technology development. And then also active around pilot projects to advance electric mobility, delivering thought leadership locally, internationally, and as well advancing uh, skills development across the ecosystem. 
So when we speak about ecosystem, uh, it is not just about the vehicle or the mobility concept. It is really unpacking the complete e-mobility ecosystem, uh, promoting green energy generation, uh, smart grid integration, charging infrastructure, driving corrective standards, uh, leveraging on international uh, standards development and guiding that uh, in South Africa and Africa, advancing uh, vehicle components uh, across the components for uh, electric mobility, supporting OEMs on the product introductions into the country, looking at e uh, mobility options alongside the new consumer behavior patterns, embracing connectivity within the internet of thing and, and embracing the, the vehicle that is integrating into smart energy uh, and smart systems, uh, driving the integration of interfacing the consumer through apps and other consumer integration, uh, service and skills development, uh, and also the circular economy from battery, uh, second life and battery cycling. So that defines the activities of the program for the last seven years and, and various activities alongside each uh, within South Africa and also participating globally within inside that. I think, I think the, the key retrospects globally that's promoting, you know, promoting as a driving factor for electric mobility is the global crisis on air pollution to which uh, 7 million people die each year, making it responsible for one in every 10 deaths worldwide. I think within the recent COVID crisis that's driving, you know, uh, the various developments and initiatives around uh, sustainable development alongside that. As a retrospect to South Africa, you know, the National Green Transport Strategy highlights that road transport in South Africa accounts for 91.2% of direct emissions across the transport sector. This being primarily from the combustion of petrol and diesel um, through that. And, and, and examples in India, uh, for example, breathing air in, in, in Delhi is equivalent to smoking 44 cigarettes a day. Uh, India is an example for a developing country uh, with, a, with a clear mandates on advancing electric mobility in the country. And uh, an image to the left of, of South Africa's highway where we see the brown haze that hangs over, over the province of Gauteng. Uh, that is really impacting air quality within within the cities. Uh, certainly, energy is is uh, the energy sector is eighty percent of contribution to uh, pollution, and the transport sector, uh, you know, eleven percent of that in South Africa. So, with these examples, it, it is it is on the context that Africa should not also the rest of the African continents and countries, sorry, uh, should not be subjected to this. And and you know, we need to embrace the opportunity of leapfrogging to new technologies. And leveraging on, on that, and, and what Philip also highlighted, is, is this radical change in policies and specifically emission regulations in Europe, to which we need to make uh, new stringent targets and, and following from left to right, uh, you know, the, the subsequent image at the bottom is highlighting how cities worldwide are starting to ban, uh, you know, combustion technologies within city centers to improve air quality. This stringent policy environment has, has uh, pushed the de technology development in battery technology, as well as charging technology, where we're seeing radical changes inside that. And certainly a disruption in the automotive industry, where all OEMs are coming with radical shifts on all models to embrace uh, the e-mobility revolution. Alongside that, as a retrospect in South Africa, uh, the automotive industry has been in existence since 1924. So certainly a significant contributor to the economy, to which it contributes about 7% to national GDP. Uh, the automotive sector is the largest manufacturing se sector in South Africa. And in 2019, uh, 631,000 new vehicles were produced uh, in South Africa, uh, to which Europe uh, is 60% the, is the, is of the export market of, of vehicles produced in, in South Africa. This also presents a challenge uh, such that, uh, you know, from 2025, uh, majority of the countries in Europe are starting to ban uh, internal combustion engines into, that, into, the, into the specific market in the EU. And, and the question is, where will South Africa start exporting its uh, internal combustion vehicles? Um, there is the initiatives of the uh, AAAM uh, to advance new vehicle sales into Africa and support that as well. But I think we also need to embrace the new technology revolutions that are coming into play uh, and guide that alongside that. With South Africa's automotive industry primarily stringent on and, and supportive from a automotive policy development for manufacturing, 
um, it is very much focused on internal combustion engines. And alongside that, uh, it also faces the challenge of uptake of electric vehicles, as electric vehicles are currently imposed with a 25% import uh, duty. Uh, however, uh, petrol and diesel vehicles imported from the EU attract 18%. So there, there's already a, a trade offset and a barrier in that sense. Uh, and with the activities of the various organizations uh, in, in South Africa, we are trying to address that challenge. And, and also this should be a learning lesson amongst African countries uh, in that. So embracing, you know, the next step is also looking at fuel quality. Uh, unfortunately, South Africa is still at Euro 2 level fuel quality. Uh, and this is also a contributor towards the pollution in South Africa. Um, and also a challenge that the automotive manufacturers face to which they need to detune uh, the new vehicles being introduced into South Africa uh, based on the fuel quality. Alongside a, a, a fuels policy environment, Cleaner Fuels 2 is still in draft and, and still awaiting uh, approval and investment to, to upgrade the refineries alongside that. So the, the challenge is, um, is with this investment required, do we embrace cleaner fuels? or do we leapfrog into embracing electric mobility infrastructure? As a country, there's certainly the vision uh, towards uh, 2030 under the National Development Plan that key, has key um, milestones and, and actions around unlocking the green economy, which, which also embraces electric mobility. However, there, we, we certainly, as much as that's a vision of, of 2030, we certainly need the interim policy, uh, not only policy development, but policy implementation to take us there to, to 2030. Um, there's also a role for local governments and, and to which certain uh, global local governments and cities have, have embraced uh, the, the initiatives and support for electric mobility in the city of Cape Town, uh, alongside other cities, alongside the C40s agreement, including city of Chuane um, uh, and Etipini as well, in terms of promoting fossil fuel streets, uh, are such significantly uh, initiatives that local government can do. In the South African environment, uh, there's the uh, South African Automotive Master Plan that comes into effect from 2020 to 2035. And with that, there is a roadmap that is identified to which we, we still need to see further frameworks around that roadmap in terms of energy efficient vehicles, uh, technologies and advancing on, onto that to expand the global market share of South Africa's automotive environment. And it's not just personal or you know, passenger vehicles that we see electric mobility. There's certainly a number of uh, initiatives that can be leveraged and, and, and typically happening in South Africa is government fleets on electric vehicles, mining on, on, on electric uh, underground mining vehicles, uh, electric bike shares, ecotourism. Uh, the image in the middle is a proudly South African uh, low speed vehicle that is already in the logistics environment on, on, on first and last mile delivery. Um, and utility vehicles, you know, um, commercial bat battery electric vehicles, electric motorcycles, and other initiatives in, in that space. So certainly you see that it's not only passenger vehicles, we really need to embrace um, uh, you know, mobility as a whole. Infrastructure is also uh, expanding. I think it's ahead of the, the electric vehicle car park through uh, alongside the OEMs and other multiple uh, stakeholders that are embracing and deploying infrastructure in the country. Uh, it is predominantly within the urban environment, but also developing on the highways uh, alongside that. And certainly within majority of the market introductions from Europe, we're seeing a radical shift in market, uh, on, on market development in Europe, and certainly that will follow through into South Africa and Africa. I think with that, we also need to embrace um, the, the regulatory barriers from import and, and, and uh, duties in that, in that retrospect. Uh, the broader market in South Africa, in Africa has got a large market, possibly 80% of used car vehicles, which is predominantly ICE. But again, in Africa's context, we need to look at the import duties in that context for uh, alternative vehicles, powertrain vehicles, such as hybrid and electric vehicles as well. And as alluded to, you know, we need to embrace the full transport ecosystem from personal mobility to passenger, to high performance, to uh, commercial uh, and as commercial uh, vehicles, as well as public transport, marine and aviation, that the opportunities lie towards embracing electric mobility. So, you know, as one of the topics of discussion, you know, uh, should Africa become a dumping ground? Certainly not. And there's also a possibility to, to leapfrog Africa uh, based on utilizing Africa's mineral wealth. 
Um, this is not easily achieved, but certainly acknowledge that uh, the global ecosystem is benefiting from minerals within South Africa. And how do we drive the agenda from political will, industrialization, and market opportunities to, to embrace electric mobility for Africa and possibly by Africa uh, for Africans going forward? And, and, and the, the, the opportunity is that um, we are not alone in Africa alongside that through initiatives uh, like Avere uh, within Europe. We have the opportunity to leverage uh, you know, international based practices. And, 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 and certainly not make the same mistakes that, that emerging markets and countries have made and, and share heels experiences within Africa towards embracing that. So with an introduction and experiences within Africa, uh, this is what we certainly hope to achieve and, and share alongside that advancing um, electric mobility in Africa through various role players. So without further ado, um, our next introduction is going to be from uh, the United Nations Environment Program in Nairobi in Kenya. And with that, uh, David Rubia, who is online with us, the program manager uh, under the Air Quality and Mobility Unit, uh, will share some experiences uh, within the UNEP um, and uh, insights from, from their perspective as an entity of the United Nations. And, and, and activities already on the ground within uh, Kenya driving the activities they're on. They earlier had an Africa Clean Mobility Week in, in 2013 that brought about 47 African countries together in terms of you know, advancing electric mobility or cleaner mobility in Africa. Uh, and certainly that is one starting point to which the, you know, the, the colleagues at uh, UNEP in Kenya have certainly been engaging and advancing alongside the International Energy Agency as well on advancing electric mobility and coordination of, of various uh, efforts. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite uh, David Rubia to, to join us and, and share insights from, from uh, Kenya as well as UNEP. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, uh, thank you all. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm excited to be part of this forum. Um, first off, apologies from um, uh, the, our unit head, Rob De Jong, he was scheduled to be on this call, but I uh, wasn't able to attend. So hopefully I can be able to fill his boots on short notice. Um, as uh, Hiten has, 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 has mentioned, we're working on electric mobility. Uh, I have been working on electric mobility for a while now. I work with the Sustainable Mobility Unit for UNEP, which helps developing countries to develop sustainable transport policies. So we've got <clears throat> a lot of history working on cleaning up of fuels, uh, looking at improving fuel uh, economy of existing vehicle fleets, uh, and looking at promoting non-motorized transport modes, so walking and cycling. We don't specifically work in um, public transport, but we work on technology for public transport. Uh, we work a lot with partners who have a lot more expertise on public transport, um, ITDP, uh, and the like. Now, uh, in terms of uh, electric mobility, um, my just some thoughts to weigh in here. I think for me, the first thing that I like to always share uh, when we're speaking about electric mobility for Africa here is that I'm guilty, as a lot of people may have been, uh, maybe guilty of having thought of electric mobility maybe four or five years ago, or maybe six, as something that was maybe not necessarily of importance for Africa, but something down the road, uh, something more for like a Denmark or a Sweden, as in we have more pressing issues here was the mentality. But one of the, thi the, bi the big transformation for me that when it clicked was when we look at the mobility model for many developing countries and here focusing on Africa, you quickly realize it's very flawed. It's, it's first of all, we look at our vehicle fleets outside of maybe South Africa and Egypt, it's largely based on imports. Uh, so it's largely based on imports of used vehicles. So those countries are not enjoying the uh, manufacturing uh, economic benefit of, of the cars that they're driving. And then if you look at the fuels that they're, that they're driving around on, also those are imported. And so there's a huge foreign exchange loss uh, in terms of the energy that, that's used for mobility. But if you look at the uh, energy or the electricity uh, generating potential for many countries looking at what's installed as the potential. First of all, there's a huge wealth of renewable energy potential, be it tapped or, or untapped. 
And so we're, we're sitting on a stock, and, and Hiten, you mentioned it in terms of minerals, and that's more for the battery side. But if you look at the energy side, we're sitting on a wealth of energy that's not being utilized. And so you quickly realize if you look at the mobility model, we are not taking advantage of a, of, 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 of a differential that we should be. Uh, and of course, so this all leads to the economic benefits of switching to low emissions mobility, uh, where you could improve uh, manufacturing, you could improve the energy, or should I say balance of trade based on energy and things like that. So for me, you know, four or five, actually it was more than that, about six years ago is when that, that, that hit me and it, it became clearly evident that this is something that's very important for, for Africa. And the last part is obviously, if you look at our motorization uh, sort of projections from the IEA, we're going to almost triple our fleets from, uh, by 2050 based on a 2005 baseline. And if, if um, you are considering vehicle, fuel, uh, sorry, internal combustion engine uh, fuel efficiency upgrades, uh, you know, 15, 20, 30% is not going to cut the reductions of emissions we need to meet our, our climate agreements. And so we need a huge disruption. Again, electric mobility comes into play, uh, supported, of course, by uh, transitioning to efficient public transport systems, uh, designing our cities to include uh, better access for non-motorized transport. And so when you look at that, you start realizing this, this, this is actually an intervention that is for this region. Now, looking at the talking points for today, and apologies for not having slides ready, um, the last minute uh, uh, bring on to this. Um, some of the things that I uh, that resonated from Hiten's talk, and that obviously are things that we've <clears throat> we're um, uh, we're working on. One is the importance of awareness raising. I think for me, <clears throat> if I could be very sort of um, uh, if I could say, what are the issues? I think one is an issue on awareness raising. You have a lot of policymakers, a lot of stakeholders who largely were unaware of, or just much like I was actually, to be honest, of the importance of electric mobility for their mobility plans and also what potentials they're sitting on. So aware, electric, I mean, electric mobility awareness raising should not be under, understated, the importance of even having these conversations. That's one, and I'm happy to say, I think that in the last few years with all the different partners talking about it, staging events, um, you know, the electric vehicle road trip in South Africa last year comes to mind in many such uh, uh, forums. I think the war on awareness raising is being waged well, and I, believe, and I dare say that that war will be won. I think a lot of policymakers are now aware that this is something they should be thinking about. You're seeing a lot of uh, countries coming up with declarations of, or, or you know, Rwanda, South Africa. A lot of countries are coming up with intentions to migrate to fully electric fleets in one form or the other. So I think that's one important thing that I can say. Um, there's always the conversation about sharing lessons, and so that comes with awareness raising and 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 and, and networking. And so I think that's very important. One of the things that stands out for me for, for Africa, for electric mobility from our project working, maybe I should have mentioned that, I'll touch on that a bit later, is the opportunities uh, from uh, two and three wheeler mobility. The opportunities uh, that exist in, in Africa for two and three wheeler mobility. If you look at a lot of cities, there's a lot of um, growth in motorcycle and or three wheeler fleets uh, for, pub, for for public transport, they fill in a gap uh, that's the, for many cities where there's no proper public transport systems or that the systems are not efficient. There's a lot of congestion. So you see a lot of these fleets growing. Now one, they, they create a lot of employment for youth. And so they, you can't wish them away from a, from an from a economic perspective. There's a lot of opportunity, even though they came about because of failure. But there is a need to look at one, the emissions from these fleets, and two, how we can transition them, obviously, to electric mobility, reduce those emissions, but also how we can transition them to a, a mobility model where they, in, they, they integrate well with public transport, where they act as critical fast last mile links to public transport, and also uh, recognizing the importance of two and three wheeler mobility for rural Africa. That's one that's, that's key and huge that, 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 that we need to, to talk about more. Um, I think that we're seeing more and more uh, private sector or SMEs coming up, uh, looking at manufacturing of these uh, uh, units in Africa. Now, another very important thing about two and three wheeler, electrification of two and three wheelers in Africa is that it's a huge op opportunity for local manufacturing. And actually it's one where you really cannot um, uh, have it based on imports because 
there's a there's a need for localization what works for Kampala might not work for Joburg, might not work for somewhere else. And so there's a need for localized uh, solutions. You need to start thinking about uh, your charging solutions, your swap systems and what have you. So there's a huge uh, opportunity for local innovation, a huge opportunity for linking to, to other sectors, uh, your tech sectors, your financial uh, technology sectors also, your, you know, your payment systems. So there's, there's a huge opportunity there in this continent. Um, Another thing that that is also uh, that has been mentioned as one of the talk points for this this call is, is 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 obviously technology and innovation. I think that there is a very good linkage with electric mobility and renewable energy. So there is the issue of if we're tapping into our renewable energy, be it solar, wind, or high or micro hydro or micro solar, um, I mean micro wind you will need energy storage. And so when we start talking about batteries and second life, third life applications before you even get to recycling and disposal. So should I say recycling and then all disposal. There is a huge uh, overlap and link between electric mobility and renewable energy, uh, off-grid off applications and what have you. So I think that's something that we're seeing a lot more and we need to have a lot more uh, support on. Now, probably what I should be talking most about is the need for policy, or what should I say, the big barriers. I think speaking to private sector, I think the, the policy environments are quite uh, sort of aggressive or restrictive. The taxation schemes, the, the, the lack of know-how of, of, you know, um, import and export uh, sort of frameworks, standardization. Uh, and so the need for, for policy frameworks is huge. And that's what we're working on. We support countries to develop uh, policies that support this transition. Obviously now the huge conversation is on awareness raising and piloting so that policymakers can know what, what policies they should be looking at. Uh, I think that's one huge barrier. Uh, it's one that we're, that, that we're working on along with a lot of other development partners. And I think the space is, look, is looking up. Um, a lot of other UN agencies, foundations, uh, and, and, and just you know, think tanks and development partners. So I think that's encouraging. The second and perhaps you know, next barrier, and probably one could argue it's probably as current, it's probably more pressing today is financing. Uh, talking to private sector, the access to 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 financing that is that is friendly to the to to the to the to the harsh environment, you know, so that, that that they can afford the financing. Um, that that's a big, big, big uh, hurdle, and we're looking towards climate finance uh, to try and be able to to bridge that gap for a while until there's a huge uptick of mobi electric mobility and 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 pricing is such that now we're able to go back to commercial uh, financing. Uh, for me, I think those are the sort of big barriers. Uh, if I've not forgotten anything, just look at my notes here. But I'll stop there for now, just to allow for room for questions. Um, I mentioned that I'll talk about the projects that we're working on. So we're currently supporting um, two and three wheeler projects in about eight countries or have supported in eight countries. We have ongoing work in East Africa, in Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia as well as in Rwanda, and we've worked a bit in Morocco, where we try to do some feasibility studies, collecting baseline, baseline assessments of the markets, looking at local uh, manufacturing potential, energy outlooks, uh, fleet growth, so that we can see how we can be able to, 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 to base, and also looking at policy baselines, where we can anchor policies, where, what are the good takeoff points. In, in these countries, we're also going to do pilots for ele uh, electric two and three wheelers. We've started in Southeast Asia countries. We've got pilots going on in Vietnam and Thailand, sorry, Vietnam and Philippines and about to launch in Thailand. Uh, we're also working in a lot more other countries and I can mention on fiscal incentives for light duty vehicles where we work on fuel economy. We also bring in fiscal incentives for light duty vehicles. And we have about eight country project or city projects going on looking at uh, improving uh, the bus technologies uh, to include uh, suit free technologies, including electric mobility, electric uh, buses. Then now lastly, we're working on a huge program uh, together with International Energy Agency and a lot of other partners. Uh, that's funded by the Global Environment Facility and also together with another, it's partnered with another project uh, funded by the EC, it's the EC Solutions Plus project, again, led with led by Wuppertal Institute and uh, the UEMI uh, initiative. 
uh, these are going to bring on board a lot more country projects in Africa for the GEF pro uh, program with uh, Seychelles, Burundi, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Madagascar, and 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 I believe and Sierra Leone. That's right. So these these countries will be funded to to help develop policy frameworks, obviously for electric mobility, and also look at demonstration studies for different aspects of electric mobility. Some of them will have two and three wheelers. Some of them will have uh, buses, and what have you. Which brings me to the last point. I think another critical critical aspect, and this last point, then I'll let you guys have uh, the floor, is um, the looking at mass transit for for Africa. And linking and and, and 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 within with the lenses of electric mobility, I think one of the things we're seeing is that there's a huge opportunity because of the the unique sort of system that exists. This paratransit, uh, small minibus sort of pu public transport systems uh, that are private, uh, operating as public transport systems. Uh, there's a huge conversation going on of how to transition this to electric mobility. Uh, there's conversations on 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 conversions. Um, whether they, whether those are fiscally viable now, that that still waits to be seen. But the important thing is that it's an it's an opportunity for innovation, where we need to take what's existing and incorporate it into the future. So if we take those public transport power transit systems and just kick them to the curb and bring in, you know, your 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 you know, public transport system from, an, from say, a, a OECD city, you might have long-term problems based on integration and based on resistance. So there's this unique sort of petri dish you have in Africa here where you say, how are you going to be able to transition to good public transport systems taking into account the existing modes or the existing uh, industry and how you, how you link those two? So that's another thing that's an opportunity I see. It's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity uh, within Africa. But I'll stop there. Uh, and thanks, thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks, David, for those uh, interesting insights. Perhaps you know, just uh, on on before you 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 run away, step off. You know, just in 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 your um, activities and, and the group within UNEP um, in in Kenya, what would you say are the top three challenges on uh, advancing um, electric mobility and sustainable mobility uh, in African countries? Uh, is it a case of political will financing? I think there's, there's certainly in, in, you know, initiatives from a number of DFIs and other funding avenues um, in, um, that are available globally. So just from, from your experiences, you know, it would be just good to see um, on, on your opinion on that. I think it's a mixed bag, to be honest. It's, and that's what makes it a bit even more challenging. So there are situations where there's a sense of lack of political will but again, I, I link that to a lack of awareness. I think connecting the dots was a challenge for, for a lot of us. So, so I think that's a, that's a job that we need to do where we connect the dots because you hear this lack of political will, but there's countries that are trying to look at improving their manufacturing. So they've just not seen the connection between their already stated goals. Or, or for example, you have countries that are trying to increase um, the penetration of electricity, but they're not seeing the link between that in electric mobility. So I think for me, it's just about connecting the dots. I mean, Kenya is a good example where there's a lot of focus on electric mobile, uh, ele penetration of electricity, but there wasn't, it wasn't linked to electric mobility or anything. So now there's a sort of an oversupply, if you will, of energy at a high cost. But then now all of a sudden that you can see the power supply company, the power generation companies uh, sort of really latching onto electric mobility saying, oh, whoa, now you can be able to use the energy that we've supplied. So I think it's connecting the dots. I think an another uh, challenge is, is, is time. I mean, think the change is coming, but it's taking it's taking a while. Time is time is a challenge, where you where you get the right signals, the right champions in government, but the 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 you know the private sector is still struggling to bring things in, or, you know, that help them set up. So the policies are not happening fast enough. So I think that's something that we as developing partners that are sort of also realizing we are also not moving fast enough. We're not set up. Electric mobility is challenging a lot of organizations, I have to say. Um, we're, we've struggled with getting our pilots going because of how we are set up and how we are not set up to do certain things. We're not set up to dig ditches, if you, if you will, you know. So it, it turns out that time is, a, time is of the essence, and so we're, we're struggling with that. I think financing, um, when you talk to, 
to financing institutions, they talk about risk, they talk about, um, you know, viability, there's they still a very traditional way of approaching financing electric mobility, which is a whole conversation about risk, whole conversation about paybacks and all those things, which compounds the time issue we're talking about, but it also really makes it such that not much money is flowing. I think it's starting to become unlocked, but I think a lot more money needs to be to be available to private sector to be able to get that change. So I'd say to answer your question briefly, I think I think it's a it's it's a it's a mixed bag. It's it's this interesting matrix of of getting the right awareness out and then quickly trying to get some policies in place to unlock to unlock some 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 uptake. You know, so for example, you have really good uh, uh, partner uh, private sector uh, partners you have in South Africa, but the, up, the uptake has not been there. So how can those quick fast adopters be able to be supported with some quick, let's not call it permanent policy shifts, but some quick exemptions or some quick sort of um, uh, breaks to be able to at least have something on the ground uh, operating in a, in a big way. I mean, I know for, for a fact that when we did the electric vehicle road trip last year, that was the first time there was, uh, I think, homologation for an electric vehicle in South Africa. And so you, and this is a country that's manufacturing a lot of vehicles, so you realize quickly, wow. So, the, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, there's just this need to unlock things. So I think for me, that's, it's, it's a mixed bag. Policy, awareness raising, financing, um, what are the other things? Because we've done we've done webinars on this, talking to private sector. Um, I think those are the big ones that come up. And networking, networking should not be. I mean, getting these people connected. And I think that's one thing that now we try to not be a bottleneck. Entity A and entity B need to be linked and be able to have these conversations and see. And so you quickly see people teaming up. At least in East Africa, you see a lot more um, appreciation that the competition is internal combustion engine, not electric. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, David. Yeah, uh, Philip, any specific questions from your side to to David? Um, actually, not. I really took notice of his um, of his statements on the point of view because for me this is um, also quite new information in that sense. That we there is also huge overlap, and and that's what I, I see. Um, um, we are. In a way, we are different, but that at the end, it comes to the same points. It's the awareness. We need um, a, a mix of it's a mix of, of policy measures that we have to bring, and it's also the transition. It's we don't talk about anymore about about transport alone, alone and bringing people from point A to B. It's not about a, a vehicle anymore or or two wheeler or whatever. It's it's a completely change. It's a change of um, the energy that it comes to, um, what kind of vehicle it will be, and and there you see a huge overlap, and also the same challenges, awareness, and um, how to bring the message. So I'm really was um, in I, taking note of these main points, and and yeah, the potential for renewable energy is also there, and it is huge, and I think there is a lot of. Um, possibilities to explore this on a higher level. So, um, yeah, what I wanted to stress out is also in Europe, we, I cannot say that we are ahead on e-mobility. We have indeed some front runners, but there is still countries where the percentage, the penetration rate of e-mobility is really low. We talk only about few percentages. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me about African content, but I cannot imagine that they are extremely higher or extremely lower. Uh, please correct me if that is the case, but um, I think there is certainly an opportunity here, and that was also the goal of this workshop today, to see what can we do to, uh, to also to calibrate on this awareness that we have to raise. So, yeah. Um, I really thank you for your contribution today. Um, it was really, really valuable. Quick, quick, um, quick uh, sort of reaction to that. The last part of your of your of your remarks. Um, my thinking again, not not I'm, I'm not I'm not a numbers hog, but that because you have a lot more you know cars per thousand people uh, in 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 the European market than you have in in in, in the African market. It's a small penetration compared to that, but in Africa we view the penetration in Europe as big because co compared to how few you know I think Kenya is on thirty, 
I think 30 cars per thousand or something like that. So I think it's, and you know, it's going to grow. The whole conversation is about, we're going to get a huge motorization with in, increased incomes here. So I think if we were to have the same penetration here, the same absolute penetration it would be, it would be fantastic for us. But then because of where, where you, the, you know, the destination, I think it, 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 it appears a small penetration. And an example now, I was on a webinar last week and there was a conversation about the number of electric taxis in, I want to say Frankfurt or uh, some, it was, it was, one, it was a, a, a big German city and the number was like, like I think 30 or less uh, ta electric taxis for a fleet of 3,000. And, that, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, there's an entity here in Nairobi um, called Nopia, N-O-P-E-A, that's, that's introduced electric taxi. I think they have a fleet of 30 uh, here. So I was thinking to myself, you know, just thinking absolute numbers, you know, we see, we see very, we, we say there's very little uptake here, but if you, if you're already having a taxi fleet that's on order, that's in the order the same in terms of electric uh, numbers of electric taxis as is, as in Frankfurt, then, then there's a, there's a bit of traction, you know, but, and this is like, this is with zero incentives. This is with, 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 I think last year, the government passed a halving of excise duty on electric vehicles, but excise is just one of the taxes when you import these, these income, there's a, there's a duty tax, which is higher and there's a VAT and then all these things. So we are seeing early adopters against a very aggressive tax policy. So we hope that with better policies, we'll be able to see even more uptake. You know, when people start getting more money in their pocket, then they'll be able to switch quickly. But yeah, it's it's the same challenges. It's just, it's 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 early days. Uh, there's a lot of work. I think we'll, I think I always like to tell policymakers we're gonna make mistakes. We sh when we make mistakes, it doesn't mean we abandon. This direction we're going down is one is one that we need to go down. We need to switch the the, the power trains of our mobility. How the power is made is the conversation that other people can have. You know, if we're going to, if it's going to be, you know, what if it's, you know, this conversation going on about nuclear, this conversation going on about, you know, the, you know, hydrogen cells and what have you, that's a conversation I don't even get into. But I think it's clear that how the how the car moves, it or in the bus and the train and all that, we need to make it have a standardized sort of powertrain. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Philip. Um, okay, moving on to our next uh, speaker, um, without further ado, and, and actually leveraging on from some of the comments made earlier from David you know, about political work. And I think uh, Rwanda is a very interesting case study alongside that from, from you know, strong political will uh, in that space, uh, direct leadership from, from uh, the president and, and, and all real players within government. And with that, uh, we, Serge Kamunda will be joining us. Uh, Serge is the director of the business development for Africa for Volkswagen in Kigali. And I think, you know, with that, uh, this interesting developments that Volkswagen alongside the group uh, in Europe and global group have, have really advanced electric mobility as a kickstart in Kigali. And, and Serge will, 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 will share some insights uh, on, you know, on those activities and comments uh, based on, on developments on the ground in Kigali. Um, I think Serge also had previous roles within government, so it'll be good to uh, you know, get those insights as well. So uh, welcome Serge and thanks for availing the time today for your schedule to, to share insights on today's platform. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure being with you. Um, I have to apologize, I could not share with you um, my slides because Zoom um, is unfortunately has been banned from our IT system. So I'll just talk about it. Uh, I just have uh, three points to share with you. Uh, the first point will be an update on um, our initiatives around electric mobility in Rwanda. And then I'll talk about our challenges and then potential solutions we are seeing. In terms of uh, an update, um, as you know, we have started our um, um, electric mobility fleet in Rwanda um, yeah, for about one year now, and we have 20 electric cars, and uh, we have a partnership with Siemens. Um, we have now one charging station, and we are building another one. Uh, we have started to build another one this month. 
And so you may ask where are these uh, electric vehicles are deployed? We use them for ride hailing, for airport shuttles, and as well for um, corporate car um, solutions, uh, corporate car sharing solutions. Um, yeah, so that is uh, the status update. And I must say we have started this, um, as the previous speaker was saying that, you know, it's a, a fleet that comes to Africa without much um, prerequisite framework. We've started it as a pilot phase and uh, before actually uh, policies were implemented. Um, however, the government had indicated a strong will and has supported us, for example, like the importation of uh, charging infrastructure or fully built units, uh, vehicles um, that could be imported tax free. Um, so in terms of uh, challenges, the challenges we have are really long-term challenges and challenges that are going to um, have to be addressed uh, primarily by um, the government, but in partnership with the private sector. The first challenge that comes to mind is, of course, the, electric, um, um, the electricity tariffs. So you know that most African countries or countries worldwide, tariffs have a subdivision. You have an industrial tariff, a residential tariff. And so the electricity tariff for electric mobility is sort of a new kids on the block. And another challenge that comes with it is that um, now um, most of the countries have privatized their electric utility companies. And so you're dealing with a private sector player um, and um, the government would have to pay that uh, private sector player some subsidies should the tariff go down. And um, you find that yes, now we have in Africa actually a problem of excess capacity, but then when you go to the um, utility companies, they will tell you, yes, please come, come, uh, we want to offload our excess capacity, but you have to pay. And so you have to pay uh, a significant amount. So that is now a discussion that uh, has to continue, uh, be, you know, has to continue and um, it has to involve the government, the utility companies and, and the mobility service providers. Another challenge uh, pertains, of course, to the charging infrastructure. Where are they going to be located? Um, there's issues of land access, there are issues of uh, grid reinforcement, and, and so that comes at a cost. And that has also to be um, part of a dialogue. Um, one is also a problem of um, the governance of those charging infrastructure. Um, for example, are you going to have one charging infrastructure uh, oasis, so to say, in a city where two wheelers and um, cars are going to charge? Are you going to use the traditional network of uh, fuel uh, stations? We have to, sorry, um, I'm using my phone. Uh, we have to answer. Then uh, there is, I think, um, a much bigger challenge is that when countries opt to shift to, towards electric vehicles, they, they think it will be cheaper because they say, hey, we are no longer importing fuel, that's very good. But there is a high acquisition cost for electric vehicles and it, it's going to be um, with us for the next few years. And we have to understand how this high acquisition cost will be managed. The way, of course, we have tried to manage them is to uh, try and spread the acquisition cost um, uh, across multiple users. Um, but that has really um, been done out of corporate bravery from Volkswagen. Um, if you want to scale it, uh, we have to find solutions. And so what are those solutions? I think one of the solutions is to have platforms such as this to, to mobilize uh, understanding around the issue of uh, electric vehicles uh, to see that it is really something that is coming to change uh, a whole ecosystem 
Um, I can give you an example. Um, we have in Rwanda 12% of our trade deficit caused by a few products. So if you are now uh, opting for electric vehicles, that is something that is going to change um, our macroeconomy. And we have to understand now those savings from a macroeconomic perspective, how they translate into um, uh, more affordable access to, to as electric vehicles. Uh, there's also um, something we have to be cognizant of um, is that in the future, if we, Africa uh, continues um, to do business as usual, we may have a problem of even having access to those vehicles because um, number one, the, the cars are subsidized in, in industrialized nations. So car manufacturer would prefer to send those vehicles in countries uh, in, where, in which governments uh, have, have subsidies uh, for those vehicles. But then those vehicles also require a different sort of infrastructure and they are coming together with a new wave of, um, of uh, uh, cars now being more computers on wheels. And so you would have to have a smart city, you would have to have uh, different type of roads, maybe. Um, and so Africa stands uh, at risk of really um, being uh, um, behind and being unable to catch up with this technology if we don't do anything. So um, as a solution we have for Volkswagen in Africa is to pilot this out of industrial bravery, what we are doing in Rwanda and see how it works, how the battery um, is performing under tropical conditions, uh, under the type of usage that we are foreseeing. Electric mobility in Africa will mostly be for the foreseeable future, um, be operated under car sharing or ride hailing because of the high acquisition cost. So we are piloting this, we are learning from this, and I think it's our solution we are bringing on the table to see, to, 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 to say, look, we, we as a company, we are, we, we are ready to, to, to have this corporate bravery and to um, uh, provide learnings from that. And we want uh, governments and other stakeholders um, to, to step in so that we all together shape, um, as our motto says, for company shape mobility for generations to come. So this was my short input. Thank you very much for the meeting. And um, it's always good to meet people who are on the same side. And I hope we can continue this uh, Pan-African dialogue around electric mobility. Thank you. Thanks, Serge, um, and, and very valuable insights shared in, uh, on that. So, you know, possibly as an OEM um, and, and certainly within a market in, in Rwanda, what is what do you see? Uh, certainly, you, you, you've kicked off a pilot in, in, in Kigali, but, you know, for the outlook on the continent, what is your viewpoint in, in terms of can we really advance electric mobility? You know, what are the key challenges that we, you know, certainly I think one specific point you touched on there was um, markets in Europe, for example, that have, you know, the supporting subsidies uh, that, that is available in Norway, for example, and, and also what they've achieved, you know, from um, the revenue that they've gained in, in, in the fuel industry and, and, and um, you know, being able to do that and lead in Europe uh, a specific market on that. Where do you see, or what is your viewpoint from an OEM perspective um, in Africa as a whole? And, and possibly challenges, you know, what are these challenges, opportunities and challenges? So, electric mobility will come in Africa, whether we want it or not, it's a matter of time. The question is, um, are we going to benefit from it? As the previous speaker has mentioned, um, there is an opportunity uh, whereby Africa can even participate in the value chain. Uh, for example, uh, you know that Africa has uh, mineral deposits that are important for electric mobility. Uh, so the question is really whether we are going to be like at the beginning of the last century where we saw vehicles as something exciting and then we, we, we just um, 
100 years later, ended up being importers of used vehicles. Uh, in the meantime, we've, in Africa, we've tried to do, um, participate in the value chain, and we know that it has not worked because there was no uh, viable market size. Every country in Africa has had assembly, uh, more or less from the 60s up to the, the structural adjustment program uh, at the end of the 80s. Um, and now we have a huge opportunity with the CFTA because finally Africa has a viable market, has the potential to have a viable market. For example, if you look at numbers, um, there is no reason why we should not have the same sales of new car vehicles like India has. Because we have the same, if you look at uh, Africa as, uh, as one market, we have the same size, actually even slightly higher or, uh, size of the middle class. So we could have the same, uh, if not uh, better, uh, automotive industry like India today has. Uh, we just need to implement the CFTA and we just need to have it implemented in a, in a realistic way in partnership with the industry. Then electric mobility will be a leapfrogging opportunity and will enable Africa to participate in the value chain. But if we miss this opportunity for, uh, the, of the CFTA, and of the new technology, we will lag behind another 100 years because it's going to be very hard to catch up with the new types of technologies of vehicles. Uh, if you look, for example, at how vehicle technology has changed in the last 100 years for fuel combustion engine, it was more or less a linear growth path. But if you look at how electric vehicles are changing and how uh, computers that are now fully embedded in vehicles are changing, it's exponential. So if you are late uh, to join the party, you will be behind exponentially as well. That's the problem. Thank you. Thanks, Serge. Possibly my last question from my side would be that, you know, as an OEM and also the initiatives under the AAAM, do you see, what, what would you guesstimate as the timeline to, to see any OEM, whether it's Volkswagen or any other OEM, manufacturing 100% electric vehicle in, South Af in, in Africa, sorry. Okay, so as I'm also quite involved in the um, uh, AAAM, and so we have uh, what we call an automotive, uh, a Pan-African Automotive Pact, and um, we actually say that um, it's a mat the, the time is, is a function also of the demand, um, and the demand will be a function of policies. So um, we say that um, for the next, say, five years, um, there could be a start, or eight, five to eight years maybe. So you, you could start um, to have a significant amount of, um, of um, local value addition. So our, our vision is to say that we see Africa as one market, and then we, we, we divide that market into hubs, east, west, and south. And then um, we say that we want to organize each hub to be able to, to manufacture one model, one car model, and then that model can be shifted, um, sold to other regions. Uh, using the, the rules of the CFTA. And for that to happen, it could happen tomorrow if the countries agree to that. Uh, but um, it also is true that it takes a lot of time to develop the capacity to be um, a supplier of an OEM. And if you look, even for South Africa, it took quite some time from, from the 90s up to today to, to have the, the, the percentage of the local value addition that we have now. Um, it can be faster, of course, because uh, technology now has changed and everyone is learning, but um, a fully manufactured electric vehicle, um, if all policies are implemented as they should be, meaning we have uh, next year um, an operational CFTA, um, 
I would tend to think that um, in less than 20 years, it, 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 it's something that is feasible, um, given, given the, the required skill set and the required um, organization around it. Um, it may sound a lot, huh? it may sound like 20 years is a lot of time, but it isn't because you, you really have to, to, to develop a whole supplier base and that, that can take time. So I would, a wild guess would be in the next 20 years, but from now to the next 20 years, there will be significant value addition coming in, significant um, uh, um, input from, um, from African economies. And you know, the car technology is changing so fast that it can also be faster. Uh, and you may find that moving forward, uh, you, you, the best way to participate in an automotive value chain is to, is to uh, look at computers and uh, digitization. So who knows? But with a time frame of the next 20 years seems to be something to look at. Thanks, Serge. Yeah. Philip, any questions from your side? No, I'm just thinking also, um, we see indeed from Volkswagen a huge uh, shift, um, certainly for the European market, um, with announcing a lot of EV models in the very near future, um, in the coming 10 years. ID3 is now launched, ID4 is coming. Um, what is the plan from Volkswagen on that? Um, we know that the deliveries will indeed come um, by priority on, on the market scheme, which is Africa also in the picture here. Right, so um, there, it's a quite complex, huh? uh, because all these vehicles, as you can imagine, are now very complex in terms of vehicle release. Um, before vehicle, usually, before vehicle is being released into a market, uh, you check at the fuel quality in the market and some other regulations and then more or less you're good to go. But now, uh, releasing a vehicle that is electric, uh, meaning it's a new technology uh, that is still being monitored, that is a computer on wheels, you have to have uh, a lot of other regulations in place. Um, just a small example, you know, there are radar frequencies you have to check. There are um, uh, so many other things. Now, the problem is that the use case of an electric vehicle in Europe uh, may at times differ from a use case in Africa. Uh, for example, you know, the, the irony in Africa, we, we are all seeing all these SUVs, uh, but it's just because of ground clearance that the African consumer prefers an SUV. But an SUV has been produced to be uh, driven at high speed. And nowhere in Africa you have, okay, some countries accept uh, exceptions, but you have those highways where you can really drive at high speed. And so um, the question will come as well, we are looking in Europe, a shift towards automated vehicles, uh, self-driving vehicles. You have in Africa very cheap labor. Uh, so the question of self-drive vehicles may not be very urgent. Um, and the use case as well, again, you have very crowded roads and those vehicles tend to be now hypersensitive on any movement on the road. So um, I think, so um, I know I'm not giving you a direct answer, but it's just to illustrate that it's a complex question requiring some customization uh, on the African reality. Um, so, and th that's why I say also there is a, a huge danger that if you're not adapting fast as an ecosystem in Africa, we may see that the vehicles of the future are totally um, not usable in Africa. And so what we are doing now is to at least gain um, more, more, more knowledge with our pilot phase, collect more data, and, and see where we, we have to be careful and see maybe where customization may, may need to occur. 
Yeah, I, I, I fully understand it. it. And it's indeed the recognition that, um, yeah, we, we are not building cars anymore. Eh? We're building um, a vehicle around the battery with a, a lot of technology inside, and it needs adaption. And that's also what we, the message that we bring, it's not no longer about transport, it's, it's, it's about the mobility aspect, and the energy aspect, and the data aspect, and use it in the wise mm -hmm in a wise uh, way. And therefore also, it, I think it's also only on the OEMs that have recognized this, that they have a future. Um, still thinking that we can build a car and putting a battery inside. For them, I'm a bit afraid for them, but okay, future will show, of course. Thanks, Serge. Thanks, Philip. Great. Um, so moving on to the program, um, our next uh, speaker uh, panelist is uh, Eve Nono, who is the Vice President of Mobility Solutions uh, for the region of Africa. Um, I think uh, what's been interesting from, from Bosch perspective is the Bosch Africa Smart Mobility Program that they earlier held, I think uh, Eve, that was last year. And, and I think, you know, very interesting insights coming out of that in showing the opportunities uh, with that. So uh, welcome, Eve, and thanks for availing your time today out of your busy schedule. And, um, you know, just insights on, from Bosch perspective in Africa, and also reflections on the smart mobility program that you held and, and learning lessons from that. And, and where does Bosch see opportunities in Africa and, you know, shortcomings and, and insights from yourselves as well. I think as an additional member to the AAAM as well, it'll be also good to see how that, you know, the Bosch's role within that ecosystem in leveraging, you know, uh, Bosch's portfolio globally and how can we bring that into Africa. Thanks, Eve. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you, all colleagues. Uh, uh, it's very uh, uh, a pleasure, but also a great opportunity uh, to discuss and to, to provide some input. Uh, thanks again for providing this platform an opportunity. So from a, from a Bosch perspective, uh, when we look at mobility today, um, as all of you might be aware, the mobility globally uh, a business or the mobility industry is facing a new challenge. And the new challenge is due to the fact that uh, we are getting in an area where we do not grow anymore. Um, I remember this question uh, three years ago or four years ago when we talk about hitting 100 million car per year. But if you look at the forecast nowadays, uh, there is no forecast right now. We show you on a short term or mid term in the next two or three years that the global vehicle population will overcome, uh, overcome the 100 million, uh, I would say, a magic threshold. What does it mean? Uh, or what's the reason for that? So when we at Bosch look at that in the, in the context of Africa, but also globally, mobility, we look at from the perspective of uh, electrify, which is a big a game changer today, electrification of vehicle. Then we look at automated, yeah, self-driving car, depending on which level you talk about, even level drive. Is a level three is already a significant shift compared to what we have nowadays. And then we look at connected. So this means the connection uh, of, the, of the user with the vehicle or between the vehicle and whatever, how the, the, the network look like. And then, and then we also have the third dimension, which is about going across all three areas is the personalization. So personalize. Because also we see a shift in the thinking of the mobility user, and those shift, uh, uh, this shift is not just opportunistic; it's a sustainable shift. It's in the perception. Uh, what it mean um, in the context of Africa? What we do? Well, we just say traditionally, usually, or my view is that it's a topic of supply and demand. If you look at supply and demand, uh, then let's start with the demand. For me. Um, for a long time, we have been debating about that, but I think right now everybody on the same page. This, uh, it is unprecedented uh, if you look at how much the population in Africa will develop. 
right? From today, 1.2 billion inhabitants. And we, take, we talk about by end of, the, uh, end of the next two decades to have this amount doubled. This is why I mean every fifth person on the globus will be an African. So this is one topic I think we cannot deny. The second topic is that if we look also what is happening on the, uh, the side effect of this growth population, this means increasing middle class, this means the rapid urbanization and the civilization. Today, uh, if we look at the production by end of this decade, I'm not talking about 2040 or 50, by end of this decade, we talk about 70, one seven cities in Africa with more than 5 million inhabitants. So you can imagine what it means because a such city also needs mobility and it needs mobility in all, in all its aspects. So when we look at that, uh, when we look at that mobility in all these aspects, we see a growing demand into shiftability between model, model of transport. This means the intermodal approach and which is also uh, it is translating in the need of the mobility user. So today, regardless where I am, I have an end destination and I want to be able to reach destination uh, in a safe, in affordable, uh, but also probably in an environmental friendly way. So how do I do it? I can, uh, I can ride, maybe uh, take a, a motor taxi and then I take a bus and then I take uh, you know, if you have to go for, from Mombasa to Mombasa to Nairobi, uh, you might have even those trains, including train. You maybe take the train for 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 a certain a certain portion of your 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 journey. Then you will step in into the bus. After the bus, you might take uh, the taxi. And depending where, if you live with a remote, maybe after the taxi, taking the taxi or the Uber, you have to take even a, a bike, right, uh, to get to your home. But what that means, uh, the mobility user uh, and the expectation is, uh, is sustainable to bring sustainability among this chain of different mode what you use. Uh, and how to do that? So I don't think that there is one solution, but also we see uh, the topic in Africa as a topic of, um, of uh, with huge potential for us as, as a company, as, a, as an enterprise. And the, for me, for me and, and, and also for the team, it's really first to understand what are the local requirements. Because uh, you mentioned that even before about the topic of leapfrogging. Yeah, I believe uh, uh, Africa demonstrated in different use case this ability to leapfrog. Um, but because also they have to leapfrog with those uh, development uh, which are taking place. Therefore, this will happen. But I don't think that will be something across all the country across across all the region. For instance, Rwanda is a, an innovative driver in the continent, is positioning as south. The colleagues have talked about the initiative with, with Volkswagen and Siemens, which are not the only one. But I think that we, when we, we might observe and see different hubs um, evolving, uh, arising, where those leapfrog will materialize even to a higher extent than the other. But if you look at the average, what I will say from my perspective is for sure there will be a f increasing need and to have this uh, a, f a, flinning, a friendliness uh, affordable and sustainable mobility so uh, last year when we look into the connected and smart mobility we at Bosch uh, have decided to have take to take in a, a kind of outside in approach outside in approach mean we were and because also we don't have so many experience on the ground in the continent in Africa, the idea has been, how do you make sure that we understand the problem uh, which are currently uh, being, um, being analyzed or trying to be solved with local solution. At the same time, we wanted also to understand how the, the smart mobility ecosystem today is evolving in Africa. Because if you see the development, in the West Coast, in the Silicon Valley, is a different one like in Europe or in Amsterdam, or a different one like in China, and also with different key players. So uh, we run uh, then, based on that, we decide to run what we call our demo day, demonstration day, 
But this has been about getting uh, uh, across the region, across Africa, we started a challenge where we have uh, more or less uh, the uh, appeal all the startup to apply uh, all the startup in Africa involved in the topic of smart mobility. And uh, was, to our surprise, we had a huge participation. I mean, we talk about uh, more than thousand clicks on this application page, uh, the pay base across the continent uh, of applicant. We finally, in the short listening, the first round of short listening, we had uh, more than 220, 220 start stop, which has uh, submitted and apply. And apply mean they have meet certain requirements with their pitch deck, with their uh, validation of the idea, a certain um, uh, already, uh, I won't say proof of concept, but a certain maturity and seriousness, which was a huge amount. I mean, we were overheard with the welcome. And then if you talk about the 220, they were coming out of 27 countries, which is more almost out of the 54, the half of the region, and completely spread in the region. So um, then we took those uh, 200 in our journey, in our analysis, we, we run a, a very deep analysis and evaluation of those uh, more than 220 startups. And at, at the end of the day, we initially uh, had in mind to have 10 finalists. We end up with 11 finalists. Those 11 finalists has been then uh, invited uh, uh, in South Africa to pitch their, their business model and, and, uh, and potential for growth. And beside that, and, and in this state, we also have engaged with them with a ton of interview and to look at their uh, business case, value proposition, and also innovation, innovation, um, innovation scale or scala, if you want. So this has been uh, the idea. Uh, if you look at the business sector, we were representative there because it show you also, how we say the diversity and the complexity as well. Uh, we talk about startup dealing into the aftermarket. What we had there, uh, we had startup dealing into the agriculture field. It means uh, uh, in a, in a, from a smart mobility perspective, we had topic uh, startup looking into the parking, into uh, electrification, into a charging station, in terms of looking into uh, mass transportation, kind of uh, MPS, Uber-like. Uh, also drone, but also last delivery or insurance. So this was a very, I would say, well balanced. Out of the eleven finalists, we had eight of this business sector, and those um, those uh, this eight business sector um, have been then um, more or less, if we say, a cluster from our perspective. And the pitch has been, I mean, this has been a great event. It has been very amazing, where we brought those uh, startups owner two of them, including some potential investor and ourselves as a technology provider, of course. This has been a great learning curve. Uh, at the end of the day, we had two winners. Uh, one of the winners was uh, one in the field of agriculture, which is uh, Elo Tractors, which is providing uh, a tractor for leasing for farmer in Africa in a remote area with uh, additional service such as a telematic or optimization of that. He bring more or less a platform together where he bring the, the, the dealer, uh, including even the OEM, but also the farmer and, and so forth. Another uh, winner of our, and our, of, uh, our, our demo day has been Bupas. Bupas is based in Nairobi and Bupas is uh, focusing on boost ticketing, but not only. Uh, is acting also to a certain extent of a mobility service provider. So this has been, I would say, in a, um, in a nutshell, what has been this exercise. The key takeaway from us has been, uh, it has been very good for us because, of course, we, we as a multinational, a global one, it has been a, a very good a testament and about what is happening in the ecosystem here in Africa and that we have really uh, small medium enterprise startup, but also really fast adapter in this area. And very important is that this is for us the baseline to drive to meet and to solve the mobility issue and challenges in the region. Because it's really about how to address local challenge with local solution. So um, uh, anything small to add is that we say, for us, this has been now the foundation uh, of our 
uh, upcoming effort in that direction because uh, we truly think that uh, the outside in approach is fundamental for us to be successful in the region. Africa is very unique and, and, and need also a unique approach. So now um, after having provided you a little bit of insight about this uh, smart mobility event, uh, which is from our perspective, very successful, I would like to touch base on the other topic which has been mentioned by the colleagues. Uh, and if we talk about electrification specifically, what role Bosch is playing there? Uh, I think that this is, is no, no doubt that uh, we are one of the key players from the supplier side in terms of electrification. Uh, but how do we translate and apply? Uh, how do we engage on a regional base in this topic? What we see that is that it's really a topic of ecosystem. And the ecosystem uh, have, uh, of course, different uh, stakeholders. Uh, and only by connecting the dot and bringing the ecosystem, uh, we see an outlook for a sustainable growth in the field of mobility. And this is also the, the idea which is shared also with the Tripoli and, and also with the auto pact, with the hub and spoke approach, what we have, uh, what it was mentioned before by Serge. But nevertheless, uh, I think that one essential point is the political willingness because we have the coalition of the willing today where we can uh, mention Rwanda, we can mention South Africa, we can mention Ghana, and, and, and also other country where we have been involved and there is more to come in the future. We need to build on those political willingness opportunity because only if the government is really keen uh, to, to create jobs, is very keen to, 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 have, to provide an affordable mobility for, 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 for his citizens, then we can start to talk. And, and the question when we talk about and while we engage with the government in the lobbying, um, if it is with Triple AM or without Triple AM, the first thing I think is really about the policy framework. This is the, the, the best way to translate this political willingness in a sustainable way into what should come in the future. So a suitable, I would say, policy framework is key uh, for that. And this uh, means also not only uh, the policy framework to follow also is the topic of standardization. This also was mentioned uh, before by the other colleagues because with the standardization, um, you can also manage the topic of scale and also synergy. Then uh, the next one is about, for instance, starting station, uh, charging station. I don't know today if the charging station which are built, uh, built in, 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 a, in, a, in a country or another country are, are the same. Uh, we had the same issue, you remember, in, uh, with, with cell phone, with cell phone in Europe. Right? Europe just managed now to standardize how cell phone should be charged because there was so many waste in, with the riding harness and also, and also so expense at the end of the day by the user that there is a need to create. But I think that the priorities are good for Africa because of the size of the market and the size of the continent. So it's really important also at the early stage to talk about the standardization. The, the next topic is uh, the incentive scheme. Because if you talk about the equation of South Africa with respect to mobility, as it has taken 30 years and now the results are there. Nevertheless, this is still a discussion about how to make it sustainable because the scale is not there, right? You usually need uh, about one to two million uh, car uh, to be produced in order to have a, a very sustainable supply chain and also to get player like Bosch because we work with scale to produce some component to you. So the 600,000 car or 650,000 car is not sufficient for you. I think we all agree on that. However, if you look at the North Africa and you look what happened in Morocco, Morocco has been able to repeat South African success in 10 years right now. They produce more passenger car last year than in South Africa. Not, not more vehicle, but more passenger car. How they manage that? Because they have, uh, with with His uh, Majesty, who, the King of, uh, of of Morocco, has on his agenda to push the topic of mobility, the topic of industrialization, and that it has happened. This means. The, the Moroccan government has developed a very comprehensive and very attractive incentive scheme, yeah, for the car maker, 
for the supplier, but also for the mobility user, the person who buys the car. And I think only under those conditions this has been possible. And there is more to come, I believe. Uh, you will see more from Morocco. So therefore, for me, yes, the political willingness is the starting point. However, we, we need to make sure all the stakeholders involved that we are able to translate this political skill into, into sustainable action, which are policy framework development, which are skill development, which are, as I also mentioned before, incentive scheme in order to emulate or to stimulate that, that demand. And this is the same one need to happen if we talk about electrification. I mean, even in a developed country, uh, there is, uh, they, how long there has been? Uh, Germany is just talking or just revised this policy on incentivizing uh, electrification to reduce a little bit. But even in a such power, power, uh, powerful economic country, there is still in incentive required in order to boost and to support uh, this demand and also manage that with supply. So I would say I, uh, I will uh, keep it short if you will keep our <laughs> cool talk even longer. Uh, you can see how personally, but also Bosch is passionate about the topics. But I would like to open uh, for questions and maybe comment from the other colleagues. Uh, thank you, Eva. Thanks, Eve, for for the key insights you shared. You know, from from Bosch Africa as well and, and global. Perhaps just one specific question from my side. Uh, with your um, Serge earlier gave an indication of you know possibly 20 years until we have a possible battery electric vehicle manufactured in, in, in Africa. You know, with, with Bosch's insight, and I think you know, Bosch as a global supplier to multinational companies, OEMs, you know, what would be your insights from that? You know, is is would it be longer than 20 years? So do you see opportunities, you know, in, in unpacking component supply from Africa through Bosch? for electric mobility. Do you think there's opportunities? And time frame, you know, is, is, is 20 uh, years too, too far, too short? <laughs> yeah, he can take you. Um, I won't challenge the 20 years, but I will maybe comment in a different way. I think that they are good priority with it because if you look at the, from a supply chain perspective, um, why do we need, uh, if you think just for just one moment about electrification, right? And we do have, uh, seven OEM producing car in South Africa in the context of South Africa. So some of them have already the Nissan Leaf or BMW and now VW is also Volkswagen as I have announced and uh, also Jaguar electrical, electrical car here. So you know that today the production in South Africa um, of vehicles 70% is for export. So there is no doubt about if South Africa want to remain competitive, they will need an adaptation also in what the vehicle they produce in the short or in the mid or long term. So, and if you say we agree that there will be a need to position South Africa for himself to position in a, to make, to put, to put him in a, in a position also to produce such kind of car. Think about now where, if you look at the supply chain, where are the raw material coming from, right? So uh, some of them, most of them are coming from Africa and even from South Africa. Uh, you can imagine you have to shift them somewhere, the battery to be built there and to be come here back and to be put in the vehicle. But I think that we can definitely do it in a smarter way. Uh, but, and, and I think just I recognize it, but this is about, it is about how we make it work, how we, how is the incentive around that, right? How do we, create an ecosystem which also which is a fast adapter from the OEM, the one we want to start, how, which, which political, uh, political uh, framework is put in place to support him. Of course, it's not only a topic of the public sector. Uh, also, there's a lot, of a lot to do on the private sector, the homework to need to be done. But I think it's, it's need to be joined, to be done jointly. And there's also a lot of lobbying and, and our explanation uh, to happen and skills transfer to happen in this case because uh, it is a little bit also a topic of contradiction because today nowadays if we talk about electrification in Germany you know 
Germany is a, a global export, right? Yeah, and, and, but ICE and internal combustion engine has been, is still the mainstream. However, to produce a diesel engine, if you need 10 people, you need three people to produce the same engine in the value chain, in the manufacturing, to the same engine in a, in a gasoline, right? To 10 to three. And if you go to an electrical vehicle, you, can, you need one. So think about what needs to happen now also in the workforce, right? This is skills transfer to be there. And it's not that the workforce, workforce will disappear. Uh, I have seen some, some input from some uh, Deloitte or other, other uh, consulting company who show the significant amount of job that need to be created because of the complexity those vehicles would bring to. Right? I remember my time in, in, in the Silicon Valley, I had a discussion with Tesla. What has been the main challenge? They, tell, tell me, they told me that uh, with the Model 3, at this time the Model 3 was not launched, one of the main challenges has been the length of the wiring. You talk about five kilometer wiring to be bringing a car. Huh? So this brings also a complexity and certain skills, different skills we will require. So, and therefore to go back to your questions, I don't have an answer. If it's 20 years or 10 years, but I strongly believe on the ability to, of Africa to, to leapfrog. And I also think that this leapfrog won't be across the continent. And for us, it's really about finding the right balance uh, between um, the shift uh, to manage the shiftability to offer to this sustainable or, or an, an, an environment friendly solution of mobility and, and, uh, and versus also keeping in mind the affordability uh, because today we do have a lot of solution but some of the solution cannot really easily translate in the use case in Africa because the, the, the purchasing by way it's a different it's a power is a different one yeah thanks thanks Eve uh, for your comments and insights on that yeah Philip over to you yeah thank you um, yeah thank you for sharing all this um, information um, I'm quite uh, always impressed by by um, the numbers that you have shared and and the insights that you have shared um, from going yeah from the, the case or the ACES approach, um, the, the topic here, yeah, the big cities, and it's impressive that you indeed have uh, so many cities with over 5 million inhabitants that did, did need a different approach, also a different um, um, shift from mobility um, in the future. And, and I'm, I'm very happy to see that you also do an approach with this um, kind of startups and, and filter these to finalists. Um, so you, we indeed um, have committed passionates and that's what we need uh, to make the shift possible. Of course, what you mentioned in the, 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 that it has to go hand in hand with the political willingness is, is of course an important message that we should bring. And it's not, it's not so different but what we see here. It's also a bit of awareness of the political system or the politicians who are for the moment actively up running, that the shift is necessary. And um, therefore we can indeed need to incentivize um, the approach that is necessary on the different topics to answer the, also what you have mentioned, the employment, etc. But these challenges are indeed global. Um, this, is yes. not, this is not linked to to any country or any continent, this challenge that is faced by the OEMs. Yeah, we are manufacturing, the, 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 the electric vehicles that we are manufacturing needs indeed different skills. And it's a shift in also in employment. And I think the awareness to have this already now is also can, you can answer to the future. And I think there also is a challenge that we need on, on education level. And I don't know if there is really um, an answer on that, that we, yeah, before we, we did educated um, technicians, um, me mechanic engineering to, to, to develop um, internal combustion engines to work on this, but we need to shift from, from yeah, mechanical to more electronics or even on chemistry, and because the battery is a, it's a chemistry component. Do you see any 
forecast or signals that with a, diff, a different um, approach to educate these people that we, we need on a, actually on a very short term? Yeah. Okay. So um, that's a very, <laughs> it's a good question. Thank you, Felipe. So, um, yes, how to answer that? Let me maybe elaborate in this, in this way. Yes, definitely there is a need to shift, right? To shift in terms of skill set and to how to acquire those safe sheds. For instance, uh, nowadays you will see that those vehicles which are available in the South African market, those electrical, electrical vehicles, those EV also need to be maintained, right? The maintenance is the topic. The question is where they will be maintained. Um, in a, because the scale is not so huge in the moment, it is easy to say they will be maintained by the OEM. So this means uh, if Nissan, I have my lift, I have an issue, I go to the Nissan dealership or garage and I get it fixed. So if you change the equation and you say, okay, we make it more affordable and there is more than that, that uh, can be only be maintained by the Nissan, then this question raises quite, quite, uh, quite quickly and significantly. This means, okay, um, how this, uh, this maintenance will happen um, if it's not done by Nissan? How do you equip the, the garages or, uh, with those skills and yeah. also with the tools to do it? And, and I think those debates still need to happen. We see, we see some involvement on, on the bus side, for instance, we have uh, about, uh, with our franchise, more than 100 or, or Bosch car service in, in South Africa. And we have, for instance, recently be approached by a startups. We launched a electrical vehicle in here in, in South Africa about the maintenance, right? Where we discuss about the spec, what is their spec, what is the scope of maintenance, and how do you agree on the scope, what would be the standards for maintenance scope, and how do you then discuss how we skill up our workshops uh, to be to put it in a position to be able to to maintain those vehicles. However, I think that what also we should not neglect is the fact that um, I think that there is, uh, if you keep in mind that uh, South Africa, uh, not only South Africa, but Africa, when we project in 2030, uh, we look at the figures, still 70% at least of the vehicle are still ICE driven. Yeah, The powertrain of internal congestion engine will remain for a long time. Of course, there will be limited investment from the OEM to further optimize or to invest further in ICE. But this won't be overnight that we say we will have those 100 million car or 90 million car produced globally being all electrical. If we do it, it's gonna take at least 20 years based on the capacity which is existing today in the world for all OEM. So what it mean is that for me, it is about finding the right balance between both, right? How do you make sure that you equip uh, those, um, not all, all workshop will be, some of them in remote area in the village maybe don't need those skills, but some in those city, the 17 cities, we need for instance maybe a decent amount of such workshop which are capable to do it, which are skilled for do, to doing that. And then, and, but even if we don't get there, uh, even those, those other 70% which is an ICE, we see now, now that some vehicle has been banned in Europe to enter if they don't meet certain emission standards. So this means also, we need also to prepare, even the switch is not so hard like in Europe, like in Sweden, like in Norway, for EV, there would be a switch still towards better emission. And we know, Philippe, you know, Hitton know, and all of know, know that those new vehicles, the level of complexity and of the level of electronic in those cars need a certain skill and tools what we don't find anywhere in Africa and all over the place. Yeah. So this means for me, there is no way around for us to take this part and really to go through this, um, this uh, providing the right skill and to, 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 those, to those people who are supposed to maintain those cars. And this is also for you, just for information, it's not just about talk. Uh, this is also the same what we discussed with government when we meet. Um, we also, Bosch are engaged in vocational training. We have just launched a vocational training in Ghana with the GIZ, 
We have a vocational training and training center also in South Africa and other countries. So we are involved there where we really focus on how do you, um, do you transfer the required skill. Thank you. So nice to hear that. Um, Hitten, um, what conclusions can we take from this um, first uh, workshop today? It was indeed a goal to, to reach out towards uh, each other um, continents, I would say. Um, what could be the next steps in, in your opinion? Yeah, thank, thanks, Philip. So I think, you know, that the insights shared certainly from an organization like UNEP, from, from David, you know, an OEM perspective from Surge, and, and Eve from Bosch, you know, from a component supplier. I think it was a good showcase uh, from that. I think it's certainly that it's, it's not a one-size-fit-all type of solution and, and, and roadmap going forward. There's uh, certainly things that we, we need to look at, you know, all the way from policies, from uh, market share in Africa, you know, looking at supply and demand perspective. These opportunities of looking at what Africa has from a mineral resources point of view. Um, there's also the challenge of skills development. Uh, and I think with each challenge is opportunities. So I think this has been a, a start of a conversation um, to, to get those insights from the various role, role players, uh, the likes of uh, United Nations Environment Program, uh, EOEM's perspective, and, and global supplier from Bosch. Uh, I think this has provided some insights for the next steps, and, and we need to unpack that. I think what also was highlighted by, by David and, and Serge and, and Eve as well, that these sort of forums and communications need to be highlighted. I think from the uh, network of Avere and, and all the developments that Avere has within reach of Europe, um, it's certainly information sharing is critical. And I think we should continue this conversation and, and these engagements and, and publication of certainly what are this, uh, as we do a, a, a findings uh, out of this session to highlight key points that have been highlighted. It certainly drives a, a guidance of where we need to go going forward and, and what are the shortfalls what are the opportunities and challenges? Uh, I think from the information shared today, that's certainly a guideline on where we need to go. And, and we can certainly unpack that going forward on, on various bilateral activities between Europe and Africa towards advancing sustainable mobility. Yeah, what should we do to leverage um, this approach? Um, should we invite in the future more people and, and define a, a better opportunity and I also would like to invite the, the people that are participating today if they have want to share or comment on this um, it's it's uh, it's we are in a meeting format so you're free to speak uh, or contribute here if anyone wants to speak up I noted a question for on the chat from Willem um, talking about policies yeah in the context African Union. So certainly I think there's a number of role players who, you know, just to comment on that, uh, the SADC community um, and other organization bodies that, that Africa, uh, represent Africa. They certainly, you know, everybody's got a responsibility and that's really where it starts. So the African Union is one uh, and, and certainly others, uh, the, the free trade agreement that's coming into play, um, all of those certainly enabling environments to, to take the conversation forward. So I think certainly I think energy access is a key topic in Africa and, and shortfall in Africa. And I think what we need to bring to those agendas and those forums is the conversation of electric mobility. Yeah, I think we indeed have to play a role in this um, and, and look forward uh, to that. Kitten, this is David. Just wanted to add to your comments on the role of AU and and you mentioned SADAC. Uh, we definitely see that a great, a, a, I mean, actually, it's not even great value. A lot of uh, um, tariffs and you know import uh, agreements are set at sub-regional level, and so working within these sub-regional bodies, uh, we've found great success in bringing about region, uh, regional, sub-regionally harmonized policies. For example, low sulfur fuels in East Africa, and the same thing with the fuel economy roadmaps and actually even vehicle emission standards in West Africa with ECOWAS, same thing we're trying to push with SADAC. And so for sure, the conversation of policy needs to be held 
at many levels. So there's subnational. So there's you know you have your your city level, your you know your 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 regional governments within countries. You need your national level policies, and you have policies that exist that are at a higher than national. So for example, in East Africa, with the conversation of duty uh, cuts for electric vehicles needs to be had at the East Africa's uh, community secretariat. You can have exemptions on a country basis for specific pilots, but you cannot have a country arbitra arbitrarily changing the duty. So these are things that we, 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 we definitely um, sub, uh, engage with, it. with specifically to the African Union. We have African Union ministerials for environment talking about setting the agenda, you know, for the next, you know, for the next sort of for the future. So that's, that's, that's definitely a good catch and a good comment. Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay, I think we can uh, conclude from here. We um, just right in time that we have previewed for today. Um, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, uh, Hitten, for organizing the joint organizing part of this. I think it was the first good initiative to to, to kick off a potential um, collaboration between the two. Yes, thanks, thanks, Philip, as well. Thanks to the speakers, David, Eve, uh, Serge had to jump off. But uh, yes, thanks for the discussions. And I think certainly we'll continue the conversations and engagement on, on promoting uh, everybody's role and activities on sustainable mobility in Africa. Good. Thank you very much. Um, we, um, Thank you very much. To be continued. Thank you very much for organizing this. Looking forward. Thank you. Yeah. And bye-bye for now.